Good afternoon, Dr. Mulhall. Very nice to be with you again after two years of not seeing you, but thank you so much for agreeing to sit down with us for an interview today. It's my pleasure. I think that uh, this is a very important initiative uh, for your community, and I think what we'll talk about today has uh, there's some very important messages for uh, your patients to understand. Absolutely. So let's start by talking about your role at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, and you can talk a little bit about how we met and the relevance of all of that. So I'm a urologist by training. Um, I'm at Memorial Sloan Kettering and I run the Sexual and Reproductive Medicine Program. So that is a program that is devoted to the care of men's sexual and reproductive problems. So conditions like erectile dysfunction, uh, Peyronie's disease, low testosterone, ejaculation and orgasm disorders. And on the fertility side, men who can't get their partners pregnant. And then um, increasingly, we're focusing on fertility preservation. The concept that young men who are going to have chemotherapy or radiation for their cancer, what can we do to preserve their fertility and give them the chance of starting or increasing the size of their family after their cancer treatment? Okay, that's, that's wonderful. Can you just tell our audience how long you've been practicing medicine and why you decided to choose this specialized field in urology? Right. So uh, I've been practicing medicine uh, as an attending uh, since uh, 1996, so I'm about 16 years in practice. I trained as a urologist, and as is the case with most physicians, we tend to gravitate to an area that fits our personality and an area in which we've met somebody who has left a lasting impression on us. And so I trained with a chap by the name of Erwin Goldstein, who is a very famous sexual medicine physician. He's the editor of the Journal of Sexual Medicine at the moment. And that left a lasting impression on me. And as soon as I had met Erwin and spent some time working with him, it was clear to me that really what I wanted to do for the rest of my life was do an area within urology that was largely underserved, an area that many urologists think of as not being that important, but of course, which has a huge impact upon the quality of a man's life, and that's sexual and reproductive medicine. Thank you for answering that question so brilliantly. So, so tell us about what prompted your interest to become a fellow in male sexual reproductive dysfunction. Yeah. So, you know, when you're doing urology training, you rotate through many different specialties, cancer specialties, uh, stone disease, uh, female urology. But the area that most intrigued me was the area of erectile dysfunction. And so when I was training in the mid-90s, this was the pre-Viagra era, so there were very few treatments for this condition. And so many men were left underserved and undertreated and under-evaluated, and probably most importantly, undereducated. And education is a very large focus of my practice, whether it be for patients or for other doctors. And so it was an area that I thought that I could make a difference in. I was very fortunate to get a fellowship position at Boston University with Drs. Erwin Goldstein and Bob Oates, and I spent uh, 95 and 96 with them, and then left there and went out to Chicago to spend um, my first academic position at Loyola University Medical Center in Chicago with Dr. Bob Flanagan. So as physicians, we tend to gravitate to an area that fits our personality, okay? And I think that in medicine, Sexual health is an area that most physicians find very uncomfortable. For example, it's estimated that most physicians get no more than two hours of sexual health training during their medical schooling. Okay? So then how come a, a physician be uh, comfortable uh, dealing with this? And so there are certain personalities that are comfortable talking to men about erections and orgasm and semen. And so I just happen to have the kind of personality that's very open, very comfortable with this topic. And I think because of that, I've kind of gravitated to it and I've become successful in this area. Thank you. What are some major challenges that you've faced in promoting awareness and education and research on sexual dysfunction? So the biggest challenge is that for most physicians, this is looked upon as a relatively unimportant medical specialty. The field of sexual medicine uh, is growing dramatically, uh, both male and female. I don't do female sexual health here. There are specialists here who do female sexual health. But it's an area that tends to get um, undervalued, uh, that we're not curing people, we're not curing cancer, but we are making a big difference in the quality of a person's life. 
I happen to work at a cancer center, one of the most famous, if not the most famous cancer center in the world. And the concept of survivorship is something that we take very seriously at Memorial. Now, we're very fortunate that we have the resources to employ me, two nurse practitioners, a psychologist, and fellows who specialize in this area. Survivorship is the concept that we don't just treat and cure cancer, but we treat and cure the effects of cancer diagnosis and the treatments of the cancer. So, for example, a man has radical prostatectomy. We're not interested in just curing his prostate cancer. We're interested in making sure that he has long-term preservation of his sexual function. That's survivorship medicine. And that's, I'm part of the survivorship team at Memorial Sloan Kettering. They also exist in breast cancer and colorectal cancer and transplant medicine also. So this is a big initiative at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Can you tell us about the barriers that Memorial Sloan Kettering or any cancer treatment center faces when it comes to Caribbean and African American population? Well, I think that obviously there's a, a big discussion about access to health care and health care disparities. I'm very proud of the fact that at Memorial, we have a very large Caribbean American population, given the fact that we're in uh, New York City. So I would say that um, this community is very heavily represented in my practice. Now, that's important because we're always interested in having motivated patients. And I will tell you, among our most motivated men in my practice are those of Caribbean American descent. So for this population, sexual health is a critically important factor. Now that's important because through this interview today and through your foundation and your website, we are going to try to communicate state-of-the-art knowledge to men who may not have access to that knowledge outside of this kind of medium. Great. Do you think that our medical institutions over or under treat prostate cancer patients? Mm. I think that there is no doubt, and I think most prostate cancer experts would agree, that there are patient populations who we treat, whether it be with surgery or radiation, who perhaps we may not have had to treat. The challenge is this. In many cases, we don't know who's going to die from prostate cancer and who's not going to die from prostate cancer. Uh, prostate cancer is, is graded on the Gleason score, okay? It's a sum that goes from two to 10, with the biggest scores being the most aggressive cancers. Obviously, if somebody has very aggressive cancer, Gleason's eight, nine, and 10, we know that those men have a higher than regular chance of dying from prostate cancer, and so it's clear that they should be treated. But patients with middle-grade prostate cancer, Gleason 6 and Gleason 7, we know that there are many of those men who, if they had not been treated, would have lived their entire lives and died of something other than prostate cancer. The problem that we face as urologists and cancer specialists is that we don't know who is going to die and who's not going to die. So at this point in time, the general belief is, let's intervene to cure a man's cancer and use a survivorship physician like me or somebody who specializes in urinary incontinence to help those men get back to their baseline function. Do you have a specific protocol at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center that encourages patients to, to become better informed about health issues? Well, I'm very proud of the fact that at Memorial Sloan Kettering we have a phenomenal patient education department. This is a department whose entire goal is to communicate with our patients effectively. So we know a man comes in, let's say, with prostate cancer and is talking to his doctor about prostate surgery or radiation. That person's focus is on curing cancer. He and his partner are stressed and they're focused on getting rid of the prostate cancer. All of the other factors, such as sexual issues, sometimes get forgotten. What we have at Memorial is we have patient education material on our website and in written form that we give to patients so that when their stress level drops, they can inform themselves about these issues. Can you tell our audience um, which website, which URL they should go to to find out um, information, patient information on prostate cancer and other yeah. cancers? So if you go to www.mskcc.org, 
Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, you will be able to access alphabetically any cancer that exists in the world, whether it's prostate or bladder or testicle or kidney or breast or colon or esophagus, they're all there. And we're very, very fortunate at Memorial to have some of the world's leading authorities in every cancer that exists. So this is a very fine resource for the community to go to and start researching. It's very easy to find a doctor and find out how you can make an appointment there also. Excellent, thank you. What information are patients given prior to surgery? So there is written information that patients are given about their operation, but also about the sexual and urinary function problems that occur after surgery. One of my great interests is the communication of realistic expectations. One of the problems in modern healthcare, where we're under pressure to spend less time with our patients because of insurance issues, is that we're not communicating effectively with our patients and we're not giving them realistic expectations. We know for a fact that there is a significant regret level among patients who've undergone prostate cancer therapy because the 55-year-old man who walks in, who has perfect erections, whose urinary function is perfect, who has an elevated PSA level, gets a biopsy, has prostate cancer diagnosed, and gets treated, sometimes comes in a year after surgery or two years after surgery and says, but I was perfect before, and now I'm not. And one of the reasons people have regret is that they were not given realistic expectations. That is the communication of reasonable rates of the consequences and complications of our treatment, whether it's surgery or radiation or hormone therapy. It's our experience that if we communicate effectively realistic expectations, that patients will say, yes, but you told me that might happen. And so the regret level is less. Hmm. One of my jobs now is to empower patients to make the best decision they can for themselves. So a 75-year-old man with prostate cancer who's got a 75-year-old wife may very well approach a decision about prostate cancer treatment quite differently than a 45-year-old man who's got a 30-year-old wife. It's individualized medicine. We need to individualize our education and our communication to the patient so that they can make the best decision possible for themselves. Right. Patients think that a doctor will tell them everything they need to hear. But many doctors will tell a patient everything the doctor thinks they need to hear. And the most effective way for patients to make decisions is to be completely informed. And that means before going to see the doctor, do some reading and some research and walk into the doctor with a list of questions that are important to you. Okay? Now, there are patients who come in to see me with legal notepads of four pages of questions on there, and I always say the same things to them. I always say to them, I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes answering every question you want to ask me, and if I don't get to every question that you want answered, we'll make another appointment and we'll get you back in. Now, this is very important in the field of prostate cancer because for most men with prostate cancer, there's no rush on making a decision. You don't have to go see a doctor, you've got prostate cancer, and sign up for treatment that day. You have time, because most prostate cancer is very slowly growing. So I'm big into get fully informed to make the best decision for you and your life. Excellent. Dr. Mohal, can you tell our audience what social and economic disparities you've seen that prevent people from seeking help for sexual dysfunction? I think the greatest disparity lies actually not in socioeconomic, in my practice, but in education. And I think perhaps there's a correlation between socioeconomic group and, and education, but really the, the final common pathway is being informed. And I have to say in the modern era where many households, most households, have access to an iPad or a computer, or you go to your library with access to a computer, it is not that difficult to get informed. So let's say, for example, you go to your urologist, and your urologist says, we got your biopsy results back, Bill, 
and by the way, yes, you have prostate cancer, here's what I recommend. There's no reason in the world that you can't spend the next week, two weeks, months informing yourself using media, using this kind of forum, using the internet, going to reliable websites, okay? From a sexual function standpoint, for example, sexhealthmatters.org, sexhealthmatters.org is the website of the Sexual Medicine Society of North America. This is a nonprofit organization. I just happen to be the president of that society this year but it's devoted to the transmission of credible information to patients about their sexual health. Can you so, say that website one more time? Yes. It's www.sexhealthmatters.org. Thank you. So I think get yourself fully informed because the disparity really is in education. I have men who come in to see me who are graduate school educated and are executives at Fortune 500 companies who are less informed than some men who come in who work for the New York MTA but who have the smarts to go to websites and read about treatments. So the final common pathway to bad decision making is being ill-informed or ill-educated. And I think in the 21st century we've gone beyond, well you're the doctor, to the point where you as a patient, you as a couple, need to start making the decisions for yourself. Get informed. Excellent. Now, we met about two years ago. Can you just tell our audience how you got involved with the Jamaican Diaspora Prostate Cancer Conference that was partially sponsored by Duncan Tree Foundation? Right. So, uh, Dr. Lou Campbell is a, a very uh, well-known and revered prostate cancer expert at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And he is uh, intricately involved with your foundation. And of course, I'm the only person at Memorial who specializes in male sexual health. So it was obvious that he would come to me and ask me to talk at uh, your meeting, which I was glad to do. Uh, because as I've said before, education is a critical component of my job description. It's not just about treating patients, it's about educating them. And so every time a man comes to see me for a consultation, part of what I do is educate him. Because the best information, the best decisions are made when patients are educated. You know, I found your presentation to be quite intriguing. Um, it really got my attention and got the attention of a lot of people that were present. Um, what did you want the audience to walk away with from your presentation? So the focus of the presentation was on um, sexual function changes after uh, prostate cancer treatment and how we minimize the negative effects of surgery, of radiation, and of hormone therapy on a man's sexual health. I'm very concerned, and I know this to be a fact, that many men in your community make decisions about their prostate cancer therapy based on their future sexual function. It's not uncommon, for example, for me to have a patient come in into my practice, whether it be from your community or not, who will say to me, I'm here today to answer the question, should I have surgery or should I have radiation for my prostate cancer? It's very clear from the currently available medical literature, the evidence, that three years after intervention, surgery or radiation, that the erectile dysfunction rates are about the same. So we'll say to men, never base your decision whether to have surgery or radiation on your future sexual function because they're about the same after surgery and radiation. So that was the first message. The second message is that you should think of your penis like your biceps. Your penis is a muscle. We as men, when healthy, get three erections every night of our lives. Why is that? It's to keep that muscle healthy. Any condition, radical prostatectomy, radiation, diabetes, any illness that prevents you getting regular erections leads to degeneration of that erection tissue. The concept that if you take your arm and you put it into a plaster cast for a year, you know your biceps will undergo degeneration, atrophy. The same thing happens in the penis, and so part of my job through our penile rehabilitation program is to optimize a man's 
health of his erectile tissue and therefore sexual function. So the concept of penile rehabilitation was a, a big topic that we talked about that day, that there are things that doctors like I can do for the man after prostate surgery, after prostate radiation, and while on hormone therapy, that can go some way towards minimizing the negative effects of treatment on his future sexual function. Wonderful. How would you convince the, an, an African American or Caribbean male to participate in clinical trials for prostate cancer drugs? What, what would you say to someone in this community? Well, this is a very complicated issue that people far smarter than I am and with more expertise in clinical trials than I have, uh, have kind of uh, debated uh, for quite some time. If you take the ED trials, the Viagra, Levitra, Cialis trials, and if you look at that, 85% of the men enrolled in those trials were Caucasian. Less than 15% were African American. So I would say to you and to your foundation and to foundations like yours that I think you have a responsibility and a challenge to start answering questions. Why is it that people in your community are less likely to enroll in trials? It would be easy to say that there's a lower level of trust among your community of physicians than there would be, for example, a, among Caucasian patients. I'm not convinced that that's the sole reason. And I think one of the ways in which you could help your community is first understanding why it is that that's the case. And then once we understand it, then we put together a plan, a program, to correct those problems. What would, you, what would you say would be an incentive? Like, what are the pros and cons of participating in a clinical trial? Yeah. So I think the cons, of course, is that most clinical trials will have some kind of placebo arm where you're not actually getting the intervention. I think the uh, first and foremost um, value to doing a trial from a science standpoint is that you're uh, making a contribution. Now, if you're sick, making a contribution sometimes is not high on your list. But sometimes there are trials, often at Memorial Sloan Kettering, with brand new therapies. The only means by which you can get those is to do these trials. These trials are usually under FDA uh, control, so they're very rigorously controlled. And so it gives you the option to have a treatment that you might not have access to Otherwise, uh, most of these trials, as I've said, are placebo controlled. So there is an arm in which you have the chance of getting a placebo. Many times, it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. By that, I mean you're three times more likely to get the real drug than you are the actual placebo. Great. What, it, what in your opinion, Dr. Mulhall, is the most important message for prostate cancer patients and their loved ones today? Well, as a sexual health physician and as a survivorship physician, I'm going to focus on my area. And the most important message would be to the people looking at this, to the men and the women, to those couples who are petrified that the wonderful sexual relationship that they currently have is forever going to be gone is that physicians like me specialize in ensuring that we get people back to as close as we can to where they were before their treatment, whether it's surgery, radiation, or hormone therapy. And that before you launch into a treatment plan, that if sexual health is an important part of your quality of life, if you're sexually active, you want to continue to be sexually active, that you should come and talk to somebody like me before you launch into that decision. Because only in that way are you going to get a comprehensive review of what the effects are of surgery or radiation or hormone therapy on your future sexual function. And then we'll put into place a plan to minimize those negative effects. So that to me will be the overarching message from this kind of web interview is that go see somebody who specializes in this. If you don't know of somebody, speak to your family doctor, speak to your prostate cancer physician, 
or go look at major medical centers in your area, whether it's in New York or Boston or Chicago, and find out who there specializes in this area. How many doctors are there like you in New York City? I don't know about in New York City. What I can tell you is that every urologist trained in the United States of America has the basic knowledge to start a treatment plan for your average patient who has prostate cancer or has sexual health concerns related to any other medical condition. There are 400 members or so of the Sexual Medicine Society of North America, SMSNA. And so they are physicians who really spend at least 50% of their time devoted to sexual health concerns. There are probably a smaller number of physicians who truly specialize in sexual function problems in the prostate cancer population. There are several in New York, but there are many a nation and worldwide. And if you do enough searching on the web, you'll find those physicians. Great. Um, do you happen to know the SMSNA's website? Right. So sexhealthmatters.org is the patient website of the Sexual Medicine Society of North America. I see. There is a physician website, smsna.org. That's for physicians. But really the focus of most of the people who I believe are going to be looking at this web interview is going to be sexhealthmatters.org. Got it. Thank you. Do you believe that there's a role for naturopathic or homeopathic, some people call it either or, one is you know all-encompassing, um, and that approach to treating urogenital or sexual dysfunction issues? So in the field of sexual health, we actually have an SMS, um, a nutraceuticals committee. Nutraceuticals are these um, drugs that are sold mail order, over the internet, from TV, to help enhance a man's sexual function. They are nutritional supplements that are sold as pharmaceuticals, ergo the term nutraceuticals. There does not exist at this point in time a nutraceutical that has been rigorously evaluated that has been shown to be any better than a placebo in the treatment of sexual function problems. For example, if you look at the Viagra, Levitra, and Cialis trials, about 25 to 30 percent of men in the placebo groups had a significant improvement in their sexual function. Now this is a testament to the fact that every man, even with physically based erection problems, has a large secondary psychological sexual component to it. So we say to patients, men are only as good as their last erection. Even if you have erection problems that are physically related to diabetes, let's say, that the psychological consequences of not being able to function are so significant that you amplify that. That you have an organic, physical, and a psychological sexual problem. Okay? And therefore you give somebody a placebo, they do better. Okay? So at this point in time there isn't a nutraceutical, no matter what you read, on the web or on TV or on the radio, there is not a nutraceutical that is any better than a placebo. The other question that I get asked all the time is, doctor, what about Canadian Viagra, right? Mm. So for the patient who is doing penile rehabilitation in our program, who's using Viagra Levitra Cialis uh, very regularly, it costs us quite burdensome. And so I get asked the question all the time, what about that cheap Viagra from Canada? First of all, it comes from a Canadian distribution center, not from a Canadian pharmacy. They're coming from uh, Asian, usually Indian or Chinese pharmacies. And it used to be thought that, it, well, let's say victimless crime. So the patient's not getting the real drug. What does it really matter? Hmm. The problem is that we now know that many of these products that come from Canada don't just have a little bit of Viagra Levitra or Cialis in there, but they have other drugs that are not declared. And so in 2009, there were four deaths in Asia from Asian Viagra because Viagra was mixed with other drugs that the patients didn't know about. So I would say before you make a decision to go to the Canadian pharmacy, that you should probably speak to somebody like me so I can give you the pros and cons and risks and benefits to doing such. 
That's interesting. Thank you. In the Caribbean community, especially in Jamaican men, they're very big on drinking Guinness Stout. And I remember um, Guinness Stout being brought up in one of the presentations, it might have been yours, um, that underscored the either the myth behind the stout or what are the potential to make the man more virile. Can you talk to our audience about that? Right. Okay. So, of course, being an Irish man, a Guinness Stout is a large part of our culture. Um, alcohol is a social lubricant. Alcohol reduces our anxiety level. Alcohol makes us less inhibited. And if you look at most uh, sexual activity in the United States, I'd say that a lot of it occurs um, under the influence of some alcohol. That's not necessarily people getting drunk or being impaired, but being relaxed. And so, from that standpoint, alcohol, in one respect, promotes sexual activity. However, it doesn't necessarily promote good sexual function. Up to a certain level, alcohol is okay. When somebody is impaired, what alcohol does is it reduces the brain signals going down to the male genitals to promote erection. So after a certain period of time, particularly if, if a man is impaired, drunk, then his function may actually be worse than it was without alcohol on board. The other issue with alcohol, which is very important for the community to understand, is that alcohol's function on the stomach is that it slows the stomach emptying. So if you have alcohol and your Viagra pill in your stomach at the same time, the Viagra pill is just sitting there and it's not getting absorbed. So what we recommend men to do using Viagra and Levitra, for example, which are the short-acting erection pills, is that they should take these pills one to two hours before their evening meal, before alcohol, and before cocktails. Because we want the pill in and out of the stomach before alcohol goes in there so it's not uh, being held in the stomach and its absorption being impaired. Okay? The final message on alcohol is that alcohol, if you have enough of it, drops your blood pressure. Right? That's why people get dizzy. One of the reasons people get dizzy. Viagra, Levitra, and Cialis also drop your blood pressure. So if you have a certain amount of alcohol, and that differs from patient to patient, and you take one of these pills, the two of them are synergistic. They act together to drop blood pressure, so you're more likely to experience dizziness. That is very, I've never heard that before. This is very educational. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What kind of treatments are you most interested in and excited about for your patients? Well, anyone who knows me will tell you I'm very excited about every treatment that improves a man's sexual function. So no man, no couple is identical. So treatment really needs to be tailored to the individual couple. For example, we talked about earlier the 75-year-old man who's got a 75-year-old wife. The sexual dynamics in that relationship will be very different than the 75-year-old man who's got a 45-year-old girlfriend. Okay? So we need to tailor our treatment to the individual patients. The things that I'm most excited about are the role of penile rehabilitation in the preservation of sexual function in men after prostate surgery, prostate radiation, and using hormone therapy. The future in this area is very, very bright. We are on the threshold of developing gene therapy for erection problems and stem cell therapy. The world's first stem cell therapy trial will start very soon at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. It is fat tissue derived stem cells. A man has a little bit of liposuction done, stem cells are extracted, and the remaining fluid is injected into the man's penis. The idea behind stem cell therapy in erectile problems is that it can regenerate the muscle in the penis to make it function better. There are lots of very exciting things coming down the road in this area. And one of the ways that people get informed about this is to go to our website or other websites such as sexhealthmatters.org. So frequently I get asked about the role of robotic surgery when it comes to uh, prostate um, removal for prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. And I think in many regards it's been a tremendous addition 
to the armamentarium of the prostate surgeon. Less blood loss, shorter stay in hospital, very clearly increased speed of return to work. However, despite the fact that the robot has been around for more than five or six years now, there is no evidence at this point in time that cancer cure rates, urinary function recovery, or sexual function recovery is any different between open surgery and robotic surgery, provided they are both done by an experienced surgeon. So patients ask me all the time, how should I choose a, a physician to treat my prostate cancer? Experience and volume are critical factors. Okay? Patients get very nervous and embarrassed in front of a doctor and are sometimes afraid to ask the most important questions. You're seeing a surgeon for your prostate removal. It's not unreasonable to say, how many years have you been doing that operation, Dr. Jones? How many have you done and how many do you do per year? All of those factors are critically important in the success that surgeon will have with that operation. The exact same is true if you were speaking to a radiation oncologist. That experience and volume of procedures translates into better outcomes. With regard to other questions that patients should ask their doctor, I always encourage patients to ask the physician about survival benefit. Whether it's surgery, radiation, or hormone therapy, patients should think in terms of survival benefit. For example, a patient has had surgery, their PSA level has started going up, and they're told by a doctor, you need to have hormone therapy. The next question really should be, what is the survival benefit, doctor, to having hormone therapy now versus in six months or a year or two years? Any physician who specializes in prostate cancer will be able to answer that question. And so we need to start thinking of, as patients with cancer, in terms of survival benefit. Because I already told you that patients think that the surgeon or physician will tell them what they need to hear when in fact the physician tells the patient what the physician thinks they need to hear. So it's incumbent upon the patient to ask the right questions. And one of those questions is survival benefit. The other question for men who have prostate cancer is never be afraid to ask the question, am I a candidate for active surveillance? It used to be called watchful waiting. And if the surgeon says no, don't be afraid to ask why? Because if you're very interested in your sexual function, the most penis-friendly treatment is active surveillance. No surgery, no radiation, no hormone therapy. If they look at this entire interview, if they come away with two or three key messages, you know, take your time, ask the right questions, get informed, I think that's the most important thing. Um, and I think these are messages that often patients in your community are probably not getting. Um, and then I think that you will uh, get from our public affairs people the, the website, the link to right. my webcast here at Memorial yes. on the impact of cancer and sexual health, which goes into you know, a variety of other, other issues. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you very okay, much. Okay, it's my pleasure.